Mr. Ambassador, Mr. Fukuyama, ladies and gentlemen. It is not often that someone attains world notoriety with a single essay. Mr. Fukuyama achieved that remarkable feat. The essay in point was called The End of History. It was published in an American magazine called The National Interest in the summer of 1989. The title ends in a question mark. So Mr. Fukuyama did at least consider the possibility that history might continue. But still, he was fairly definite. He followed the reasoning of Hegel and of his teacher in Paris, <clears throat> the Hegelian Alexandre Courgève, by stating that it is the ideal which will govern the world in the long run. Marx, of course, postulated that the material mode of production is the basis which carries the ideological superstructure. But according to Mr. Fukuyama, who here follows the German sociologist Max Weber, <clears throat> but according to Mr. Fukuyama, ideology forms the basis, and it is that which determines the economic mode of production. And what is, so he asked, what is today the dominant ideology? It is liberal democracy. After the demise of the totalitarian ideologies like communism and fascism, which have so disfigured this century, there is no longer, so Mr. Fukuyama contends, there is no longer any competing ideology. And since the march of history, if we may talk about such a concept, <clears throat> and since the march of history consists of the antagonistic struggle of competing ideologies, the fact that there is now no competitor for liberal democracy means that history itself has come to an end. As Mr. Fukuyama put it himself, I quote, at the end of history, it is not necessary that all societies become successful liberal societies, merely that they end their ideological pretensions of representing different and higher forms of human society. But what about the Gulf War? And what about the war in former Yugoslavia, somebody might ask. Mr. Fukuyama's answer would be that these wars are symptoms of nationalism or of ethnic antagonism, but not of an ideology that claims to be universally valid. Could Islam then be an ideological competitor, since it clearly does claim, does lay claim to that universality? No, said Mr. Fukuyama in a discussion I had with him some years ago, in October 1992, not far from this very building. He then said that Islam not only does not attract non-Muslim people, in the long run, he said, it is even unlikely, Islam is even unlikely to attract people who themselves live in an Islamic cultural environment. And he added that a fundamentalist Islamic regime is unlikely to give the Algerians what they so much desire. And that, he said, is the difference between Islam on the one hand and the East Asian alternatives to liberal democracy. The East Asian combination of markets, of a market economy with an authoritarian face, that combination, a market economy, with an author authoritarian face, that, Mr. Fukuyama admitted, might be a serious competitor. Now, this article by Mr. Fukuyama caused an ocean of ink to be spilt in either defense or attack. Some of the criticism, <clears throat> some of the criticism was published in this very same issue of the national interest in which his own article appeared. Other people wrote in support May I quote 
the French political thinker Pierre Asner, who put in, in, in that same issue an important, put an important question. He said, perhaps, Pierre Asner said, perhaps passions have given way to interests for good. And this sentence contrasts the passions and the interests, which is, of course, a very famous political juxtaposition uh, enlarged upon many uh, political writers. And it is this very same antagonism between, <clears throat> between the passions and the interests that forms a subject which Mr. Fukuyama dealt with in his book, not this one, but the last one, the book called The End of History and the Last Man. That book appeared in 1992, and it has again given rise to endless discussions. In this book, Mr. Fukuyama further, in this book, Mr. Fukuyama further developed the notions outlined in the article I just now mentioned. And in particular, <clears throat> he concentrates on the Greek concept of thymus, tumos, as I learned it. Thymus, which means spiritedness, or the desire for recognition, a Greek concept. And Mr. Fukuyama said that if we are all heading for a universal homogeneous state, informed by that one remaining political ideology, if we are all heading for a universal homogeneous state, as Mr. Fukuyama supposes, a universal homogeneous state which would consist of liberal democracy in the political sphere plus what he then called easy access to video cassette recorders and stereo and stereo equipment in the economic sphere what he asks would become of this thymus this spiritedness this wish for recognition and here Mr. Fukuyama evoked the specter of Nietzsche's last man who, while accepting the benefits of liberal democracy, has given up prideful belief in his superior worth and who has become content with comfortable self-preservation, what we in Holland would call Harsje, Boompje, Beestje. <coughs> and speaking about Holland, some people now seem to think that the present coalition between liberals and socialists signifies the end of politics in this country. What, they say, <clears throat> is there left to choose in future elections? And I therefore consider it my task to generate enough controversy between now and the next election so that at least there is something to choose. And in that respect, uh, I aim to follow in the footsteps of Mr. Fukuyama because he indeed has raised matters, extremely important matters, of much controversy. In his article and in his book, the last book about the end of history, he has rejected both cultural and moral relativism. And he has remarked, a quote, that Western intellectuals still suffer the severe crisis of confidence that has left liberal democracy without the intellectual resources with which to defend itself and which has led to serious doubts about the universality of liberal notions, end of quote. And indeed, these liberal notions are assailed in those parts of the world that bear either an Islamic or a Confucian imprint. And so the book remains of great actuality, and that is also the importance of Mr. Fukuyama's activities, because whether one agrees with him or not, and I for one am inclined to agree with him more than I disagree with him on the book about the end of history, everyone must, everyone should admit that Mr. Fukuyama deals with subjects that are of world importance. And many are the intellectuals, also in this country, who regret the demise of the political debate. Well, now, here is someone who provokes it, and he is to be lauded for doing so. And let me, at this point, say something about Mr. Fukuyama himself. 
He was born in Chicago in 1952. As a freshman at Cornell, he took a seminar on Plato given by the philosopher Alan Bloom, who achieved fame with his book called The Closing of the American Mind, which was published in 1987. Mr. Fukuyama went on to receive a degree in classics, and thereafter he went to Paris, where he met Alexandre Cogère, whom I mentioned just now as a true Hegelian. And since 1979, Mr. Fukuyama has shuttled back and forth between the think tank world of the RAND Corporation and jobs at the State Department, where he ended up as Deputy Director for European Political Military Affairs. He is now a senior researcher at the RAND Corporation in Washington, D.C. In January 1992, Mr. Fukuyama acknowledged in an interview his schizophrenic existence between RAND on the one hand and state on the other, and he added, <coughs> he added that if a university would offer him if a university would offer him the possibility of writing a book on the relationship between culture and economic development, he would assuredly take up the offer. Well, that book has now been published. It's called Trust. About its subtitle, I was in some uncertainty because the galley proofs mention as a subtitle the art of association in the creation of economic prosperity. But the finished article, the finished book, has a different subtitle, namely Social Virtues, Social Virtues and the Creation of Economic Prosperity. Its leading ideas have been published in an article which appeared in the most recent issue of Foreign Affairs. The day before yesterday, an article along roughly the same lines was printed in the Dutch daily, the Volkskrant, and his latest book, and his latest and, uh, and tonight's articles on, uh, on Mr. Fukuyama and on his latest book are carried in at least two national papers. So we have some idea of what he is going to tell us. But still, we should like to hear it from the horse's mouth. So without any further ado, I should now like to ask him to give his expose, after which there will be some time for discussion. Mr. Fukuyama. Well, I feel uh, it's very difficult to deserve uh, uh, so kind an introduction as uh, the one that Mr. Bokstein just gave me. And I really hope to repay uh, in gratitude uh, all the kind uh, things that have uh, been said about me and, and done for me while I've been in Holland. I'm particularly grateful to Anna Wertheim and the uh, uh, John Adams Institute for sponsoring this. I think it's wonderful that there be institutions like this supported uh, uh, in the private sector to encourage this kind of cultural exchange among uh, countries that are uh, indeed uh, old friends. I, in fact, grew up in New York in a large housing development called Stuyvesant Town, named after Peter Stuyvesant, uh, and uh, was always aware of the Dutch roots of, uh, of Manhattan, where I uh, grew up. I'm also grateful to uh, the American Embassy for sponsoring the reception uh, prior to this, and to Mr. Bokstein, whom I met uh, for the first time, as he mentioned, three years ago when I was here uh, uh, on my last, uh, when my last book was published. Uh, I think it's always quite remarkable uh, when a politician uh, actually uh, uh, reads books. I have yet to meet an American... <laughs> I've yet to meet an American politician who's done so, and uh, I think it's all the more remarkable that there's a Dutch politician that not only reads and writes books, but has read my books, so I'm very, uh, very happy about that. Uh, and I'm also quite happy to be here in Holland, because in a way, Holland has always exemplified uh, the themes that I wrote about in both The End of History and in my current book, uh, Trust. Uh, Holland uh, was clearly uh, one of the first truly bourgeois capitalist uh, countries in the world, and it was one of the first countries, in a way, to reach the end of history uh, because it developed a, uh, a stable liberal democracy uh, 
that is a uh, source of considerable uh, political consensus and uh, demonstrates this, the, the workability of democracy to you know, other countries around the world. Uh, but it is also, I think, uh, in a way, a very high trust society. Uh, in my uh, thesis, uh, high trust is related to large corporations and a strong uh, private sector. And indeed, uh, from the uh, uh, Dutch East India Company to Philips and Unilever today, uh, there's been a very long uh, tradition of that. And I know that the uh, John Adams Institute is located in the house that was uh, used by the uh, Dutch East India Company. Uh, so in both senses, this is a very appropriate uh, country to present uh, these ideas. Now let me begin by going back to the original thesis about the end of history, because I think that there is a clear connection uh, between these two sets of ideas. Uh, I am often asked by journalists uh, uh, whether I still believe in the end of history in light of Somalia and Bosnia and various other catastrophes around the world, and I always say that uh, it remains as valid as ever, because if you understood the thesis correctly, it really doesn't have to do with the occurrence of day-to-day -day events, but whether there is such a thing as an evolution in human societies as they move up from uh, agricultural uh, societies uh, through various monarchies and aristocracies up to the forms of liberal democracy and technology-driven capitalism that we are familiar with today. Uh, and I believe that in spite of the instability in places like Eastern Europe over the last few years, there still remains no alternative in terms of ideology and institutions to modern liberal democracy and to integration in the global capitalist marketplace. Uh, I don't think anybody in Holland or the United States or Japan is about to uh, go imitating Iran or Serbia as a model of a higher form of civilization. But on the other hand, this convergence at the top level of institutions does not mean that there is a uniformity in societies at the level of either civil society or of culture. Uh, and in fact, there's some reason to think that there will not be a convergence in cultures because that, in a way, constitutes the social identity of different peoples that they will want to hang on to all the more firmly uh, even as the world is homogenized through uh, the global market. Uh, so in that sense, I very much agree with my own teacher, Samuel Huntington, when he argued that uh, it is civilizational difference that is going to be the most important factor uh, distinguishing one country from another or one region of the world, uh, that advanced countries are all going to look increasingly alike at the level of institutions and what we as students of international relations or of international society will have to pay attention to increasingly, increasingly are differences in culture. I disagree with Huntington uh, because I don't necessarily think that this will lead to clash or to war or to, uh, uh, as he put it, to a clash of civilizations because I think that for modern democracies, in fact, that kind of cultural difference can be uh, in fact, quite enriching. It can lead to a cultural competition uh, that leads to change, to, to change that is positive. But nonetheless, that is the issue that we will have to be concerned with. Now, of the various things that make up culture, I believe that the most important is what has been called social capital. Uh, social capital is a term that was first uh, put into widespread use by the sociologist uh, James Coleman, uh, economists have been familiar with the term human capital for some time now. Uh, there's a growing uh, uh, agreement or consensus that modern wealth uh, resides less or is produced less by machines and natural resources uh, and territory, uh, but is really the product of the things that we carry around with us in our heads, skills and knowledge. And Coleman pointed out that there is a subset of human capital, which he labeled social capital, that has to do with the ability of people to work with one another in groups. And its connection to economic development, I think, is a very commonsensical one. Uh, there is nothing that we do in modern economic life, from running a small family restaurant to producing the latest generation of microprocessors that is the product simply of individuals working on their own. Virtually everything is the result of the social collaboration of human beings. 
And it seems to me uh, obvious and commonsensical that if those human beings have a high degree of trust for one another, if they believe in one another's basic honesty and reliability, that they will be able to do things more efficiently than in a society in which distrust is prevalent. Uh, in the latter form of society, uh, you need to regulate your relations with other people by a whole set of formal rules. You need to write contracts. You need to litigate. Uh, you need to have enforcement in order to settle disputes. And it imposes a whole series of costs that a high trust society uh, does not need to pay. And that furthermore, trust uh, and the ability to associate social capital is something that is not necessarily the product of our rational decision, that it comes from many sources. It comes from some traditional sources like religion and from uh, culture and from historical accident. Now, I think that this, uh, to me, is a commonsensical idea, but it's something that doesn't appeal to economists because they have a very different view of human nature and human motivation. And I think that in many ways, uh, we have unfortunately not been well served by uh, the economics profession in understanding uh, even the sphere, their own sphere of economic activity. Uh, let's take, for example, the debate that has uh, been dominant, uh, at least in, in North America, over the past decade or so uh, on the question of competitiveness. On the one hand, you have a group of what have been termed neo-mercantilists, people like uh, James Fallows or Clyde Prestowitz or Chalmers Johnson, who, when looking at the economic development of Asia in the last couple of generations, have argued that it is primarily the benevolent and, 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 and wise activity of state planning organizations that is responsible for the rapidity with which Asian economies have grown. On the other side, you have really the bulk of the economics profession, uh, the so-called neoclassical economists that uh, are dominant in the University of Chicago. Another of them just won another Nobel Prize a couple of weeks ago. Uh, these uh, are now, uh, these kinds of economists are now ensconced in uh, international uh, lending institutions like the World Bank and the uh, International Monetary Fund and really dominate uh, thought about economics uh, throughout most of the Western world. And they argue, uh, in contradistinction to the neo-mercantilists, that if Asia has grown rapidly over the past generation, it is because uh, it is despite the activity of governments and not because of it that economic growth really comes from markets. And I think that in a way, uh, although I tend to side with the latter camp uh, to a much greater extent, that they are both blind to what is really the cultural dimension of economic activity uh, because they both aspire to a certain sort of universalism. On the neo-mercantilist side, there's an argument that if the Ministry of Industry and uh, International Trade and Industry, MITI, in Tokyo was good for the Japanese economy, that there ought to be a parallel institution in the United States uh, to uh, promote American competitiveness. And what I think that fails to recognize is that, in a way, the need for an industrial policy of this sort is culturally determined. Not every society has a weak private sector that needs this kind of government support. And moreover, on the implementation side, not every society is, equal, is equally able to promote uh, industry successfully. Because if you have uh, bureaucrats, government bureaucrats, giving out subsidies to favored industrial sectors, uh, it is a situation that is ripe for corruption. And corruption is not, you know, it occurs in all societies, but it doesn't occur in equal amounts. That one of the interesting characteristics of Asia has been that they have been able to, by and large, uh, shield many of their planning technocrats from the kinds of uh, political and, and personal pressures that somehow in Europe and in Latin America uh, 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 these technocrats have been much more subject to. Uh, so that uh, in many ways, uh, you know, if uh, I believe if the United States were to have a similar uh, planning ministry to uh, METI, uh, it would uh, tend to direct subsidies towards shoes because, you know, in a way, we're a much more democratic society and the person would get up in Congress and say, well, shoes are in fact a strategic industry in the United States. And, you know, so that in a way, the very democratic nature of American society makes that kind of policy much less practical. So that these are not general rules that can be universalized over uh, all societies. And in a similar way, I think that there's a problem in the fundamental paradigm underlying neoclassical economics. 
Uh, neoclassical economics asserts that uh, economic activity is undertaken by rational utility maximizing individuals. Uh, or put more simply, uh, all of us are selfish but rational. Uh, we calculate our self-interest. We enter into society, into relations with other people, only as a means of satisfying those self-interests. But the sociability is not an end in itself. And I think that every one of the terms of that equation can be put into question. I think that, you know, as a, as a general description of human economic behavior, it's, you know, something like 60 or 70 percent right. But it is not right all the time, and the times when it is not right make qualify that model in certain important ways. Let's take the question of whether we are rational. The chi I would argue that, in fact, uh, in most cases, we do not act out of rational motives in the way that economists assert, but simply out of habit. Uh, the Chinese do not eat with chopsticks because they have done a survey of all of the available eating instruments around the world and have decided that chopsticks are optimal for manipulating their particular kind of food. They do it simply because that is traditional in Chinese culture. Or take the issue of utility. Uh, utility is generally understood, I think, properly as the pursuit of pleasure and the avoidance of pain in the traditional Benthamite sense, uh, that people want the greatest quantity of material goods that they, uh, that they can acquire. But obviously that doesn't apply universally because people have been known to drop out of life as an investment banker and, you know, commune with nature in the woods or they have run into burning buildings in order to save the lives of, of other people. Uh, when you pose examples like that to economists, then a lot of times they say, well, utility is simply a formal concept. It simply means that you maximize, you know, whatever it is you happen to maximize. So that if you are Joan of Arc and you immolate yourself for the sake of France, you're simply pursuing your psychic utility, uh, whereas an investment banker maximizing the returns on his portfolio is, is similarly maximizing his utility. Uh, and I think when you think of that example, you realize that, you know, if you simply define utility in such a broad fashion, uh, it makes the concept meaningless, uh, that economics has a certain power because it asserts that people are selfish. But in fact, they are selfish, you know, only a certain amount of the time. And that brings me to the third term in the equation, that we act as individuals. Uh, while obviously we care about ourselves as individuals, we are all embedded in a whole series of social groups, beginning with the family, but going up through the neighborhood, the workplace, the local community, and up to the nation. Maybe you Europeans will create a group uh, beyond that. We'll, we'll have to see about that. But all of us are not simply, we, we divide our loyalties uh, between all of these groups, and our economic behavior cannot be understood except in the context of all of these dense networks of groups to which we belong. Now, let me turn a little bit to some concrete cases because this may help to illustrate uh, how uh, social capital is different in different countries and has a very large effect on uh, modern, uh, modern economic uh, life. Uh, let's start with Asia and then move to Europe. Uh, in Asia, uh, the differences between Japan and China are illustrative of the impact of culture and factors like family in ways that I think people are not generally aware. If you try to describe the uh, industrial structure of Chinese societies, and by that I mean the marketized parts of China, Hong Kong, Taiwan, Singapore, uh, the free market parts of the People's Republic of China. There's one quite remarkable fact. All of the businesses in the private sector are small. There are very few large private modern corporations. And the reason that there are very few such corporations is because Virtually all businesses in the private sector in Chinese society are owned and managed by families. Uh, there's been a lot of talk uh, on both sides of the Pacific about uh, the meaning of Confucianism, and I think we've had some very unhelpful uh, contributions by people like former Prime Minister Lee Kuan Yew to this debate who argue that Confucianism happens to support his uh, brand of petty authoritarianism, which I think is, is wrong. Uh, and I believe that if you took a harder look at the real impact of Confucianism in modern Chinese societies, it is the following, that it promotes a certain kind of familism. That is to say, Confucianism elevates the bonds that exist between people who are related to each other 
above other kinds of social obligations. So that if you are a Chinese uh, a child and your father has committed a crime and the police come looking for you, it is obviously you know, a, a tortured situation in any culture, but ultimately in Chinese society you decide not to report your father you, uh, because your obligations to the family uh, are superior to your obligations to the state. And this has a, a very large impact on the nature of Chinese businesses because the very strength of those family bonds, the fact that there is so much trust within families means that the bonds between people that are not related to each other are in some sense weaker. You do not trust people that you are not related to. And in the case of, of, of these family businesses, what that's meant is that it is very difficult to take in professional managers or others outside uh, the kinship group in order to institutionalize and make more permanent uh, that business. We had a good example of that in the United States uh, about 10 years ago. The Wang Laboratories in Lowell, Massachusetts uh, was one of the premier manufacturers of word processors and mini computers, leading uh, a high-tech company was founded by a Shanghai immigrant named An Wang, uh, who, when he wanted to step down from leadership of the company in the mid-80s, passed over what everybody else, who everybody else regarded as the most qualified professional manager in favor of his son, Fred. Uh, and Fred was a perfectly competent, fine fellow, but not up to leading one of the most uh, advanced high-tech companies in the United States. And the result was that Wang lost 90% of its market capitalization in four years and went into uh, Chapter 11 bankruptcy. But that story of Wang, in a way, is perfectly uh, illustrative of what happens in Chinese businesses uh, time and again in Hong Kong uh, and Taiwan and, and places like that. There's a so-called Buddenbrooks phenomenon where uh, a company will be started by a, a patriarch and entrepreneur in the second generation. The fortune is already dissipated because you have no pr uh, principle of primogeniture so that the inheritance has to be divided equally among male heirs. Uh, by the third generation, the grandchildren are now studying art history at Stanford or something. Uh, they have no interest in going back to running a gritty uh, textile business or whatever uh, back in Taipei. And at that point, the business falls apart. Now, that's not bad for the Chinese economy as a whole because there are 10 new businesses that bubble up and take its place. But it does mean that that kind of society has a very hard time getting into the manufacture of, of goods that require large-scale or, uh, uh, organizations to produce, like semiconductors or uh, aerospace equipment or automobiles. Now, if you go to Japan, you see an extremely different industrial structure and, in fact, a very different culture. Uh, Japan has, uh, as you, I'm sure, are well aware, very large companies. Uh, the largest companies like Mitsui and Mitsubishi are also very uh, long uh, established ones. The Sumitomo uh, General Trading Company actually began as a 17th century uh, copper mining concern in Kyoto and now its, you know, its name is emblazoned on bank buildings from Tokyo to London to, uh, uh, to San Francisco. Uh, Japanese companies are long-lived, they are very durable and the ultimate reason for this is that the Japanese family is very different from the Chinese family. Uh, in a sense that while the Japanese family is very stable, uh, it is much weaker, uh, that social ties to people outside of kinship groups uh, are much more important in Japan. So that the Japanese child facing that same dilemma uh, of having a father who had committed a crime and, and, and asking uh, himself or herself whether to report the father to the police would in Japanese culture be more likely to report the father. Uh, in a way, this is like Pavel Morozov in the Soviet Union who was uh, lauded by Stalin for turning his parents into the Stalinist police in the 1930s. Uh, and uh, I think is also, uh, you, you can see that there's a certain relationship towards a, a kind of uh, uh, authoritarian political style that's inherent in this view of the relationship between the family and the state. But nonetheless, there it is. And in Japanese society, it is much easier to take outsiders into family businesses there's been a long-standing uh, tradition of professional management and something of a cultural predisposition against the nepotism that's very common in Chinese families. And the result is that Japanese corporations got established very early on with professional management. The great uh, pre-war zaibatsu were almost entirely uh, managed by hierarchies of professional managers uh, in the pre-war period. 
Uh, their family ownership was ended with the Allied occupation in 1945, and today they look just like modern American or uh, European companies with dispersed ownership and completely professionalized managements. And again, that's a very different cultural pattern from, uh, from China and something that ultimately, I think, is explainable in terms of culture. This is, a, this is a pattern, I think, that is not simply prevalent in Asia, but applies here in Europe as well. Uh, I have a chapter in my book that's entitled Italian Confucianism, uh, because I think that the differences between Italy and Germany are actually quite parallel to the differences between China uh, and Japan. Uh, there are very few large companies in Italy. On the other hand, there is a very dynamic core to the modern Italian economy that consists almost entirely of relatively small family-owned and family-managed businesses, and they tend to cluster in what's known as La Terza Italia, the region of Italy in the center in Emilia-Romagna and Tuscany in the Marche. Uh, and these businesses tend to do exactly the same sorts of things as businesses in Taiwan. They are good at uh, industrial sectors that don't require large scale, like textiles or design, uh, machine tools, industrial robots, ceramics, and the like. And the reason, I think, has very much to do with the structure of the Italian family and the relative uh, scarcity of strong civil institutions, at least in the southern half of the country. Uh, Germany, by contrast, is very much like Japan. It has, uh, it's preeminently the country of very large corporations. Uh, with very strong intermediate uh, uh, institutions that pervade its entire society, so that wage settlements in Germany are not uh, negotiated by the government as they are in France or uh, you know, on a microscopic level between individual enterprises and, and the companies, but on a sector-by-sector -sector basis by the very powerful private German employers' uh, federations and by the German labor unions. And in a general way, this is a society that is crisscrossed by intermediate associations of all sorts. Now, the explanation for this difference between Germany and Italy, I think, is quite different. And, and this shows why a cultural explanation can't really be universalized. Uh, in the case of Germany, I think the reason that, that uh, Germany, modern Germany, uh, is in a way blessed with such a density of intermediate associations is that uh, in some way, liberalism was never as victorious in Germany as uh, in, uh, let's say, France or England. And obviously, in the political sphere, this had disastrous consequences for them. But in the economic sphere, it meant that certain medieval institutions, like the guild system, were not destroyed by liberal reformers in the 18th and 19th centuries, but actually survived into the 20th century to be modernized into the form of the present-day uh, German apprenticeship system, which has become uh, the source of considerable, I mean, it's, it's, a, it's widely admired as the source of uh, industrial competitiveness in many, uh, in many uh, sectors. Now, what are the consequences of these kinds of conclusions uh, in general? Do the high trust societies like Germany and Japan uh, end up more prosperous than what I've labeled low trust societies like Italy or France or China? Well, obviously, in some sense, uh, no. Uh, China has been growing much faster than Japan in recent years, and Italy uh, for much of the past uh, couple of decades has been growing faster than Germany. But it does have a couple of consequences in terms of the global division of labor. For one thing, it means that in a low trust society, it is very hard to produce large scale enterprises, and therefore to get into those industrial sectors that require large scale. So that I would predict that countries like China and Italy uh, will never, you know, follow the development path of, of their neighbors, uh, moving up, you know, in an easy way into semiconductors and aerospace and, uh, uh, and the like. And what it means, and it has a very different implication, I think, also for the role of the state, which may, in fact, be the most important uh, consequence. If you look at a low-trust society, uh, it has the following distribution of enterprises. At one side, you have a large number of very small, family-owned and family-managed businesses that usually constitute the productive core of the economy. But in many of these familistic societies, you have at the other end of the scale a lot of very large state-owned or state-sponsored corporations because their private sectors do not have the social capital to produce large-scale organizations. And that means that the state in that kind of society has to play a much more important role 
On the other hand, in a high social capital country, you have a very dis different distribution of enterprises where you have a middle sector that uh, is uh, uh, highly productive. The private sector itself is able to produce that kind of economic organization. And the state consequently has a very different role to play. And I think here in Europe, that's going to have very grave consequences for, uh, for example, the possibility of monetary union within the EU. Uh, you have very different economic cultures. Uh, you have uh, countries in Latin Europe, like France and Italy, in which the state for hundreds of years has played a far more important role in economic matters than in uh, more northern uh, European countries. And even last week, when you saw the strike of uh, French public sector workers, there is a far different cultural reaction to the idea of privatization, to the idea that the state should give up its dominion over uh, the economy and give it back to private uh, uh, companies and individuals. Uh, and I think in terms of arriving at all of the budgetary uh, targets that are necessary for, for monetary union, you are simply going to have to confront the fact that Europe is not culturally homogenized and I doubt will be in, uh, in four or five years' time. Now, I want to speak a little bit about the United States because it is the country that I come from and it is the, the other side of this bridge that the John Adams Institute has been uh, trying to build. Uh, I think a lot of people worry about the United States because so many uh, ideas, both good and bad, uh, tend to originate there. And I think uh, people are often worried about infection one way or the other. Uh, where does the United States fit in in the scale uh, of low trust and high trust? Well, I think that there is a very common misunderstanding about the nature of American society, and it is probably no more misunderstood than by Americans themselves. Uh, Americans believe that they live in a land of rugged individualists, uh, and many of them, for example, admire a politician like Ross Perot whose motto is, eagles don't flock, you have to find them one at a time. The, uh, the myth of rugged individualism, uh, however, I th well, it's, it's not a myth. I mean, there is a high degree of individualism, I think, that's built into uh, the political foundations of, of the country. But the social reality of the United States has really always been different. And in this respect, I think that I would have to describe the US not as a low trust, but traditionally as a high trust society because it has always had a very vigorous civil society. It's always been crisscrossed by a very dense network of voluntary associations. Uh, this was really noticed uh, in a systematic way for the first time by Alexis de Tocqueville when he visited the United States in the 1830s and found it an utter contrast with his native France. Of France, he has the remarkable phrase, you know, on the eve of the revolution, you couldn't find 10 Frenchmen that were willing to come together for a common cause. In the United States, by contrast, he found constantly uh, schools and hospitals and religious groups and, and uh, Bible studies and, and all sorts of sports clubs that existed uh, spontaneously and gave a very definite uh, 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 stickiness to the society. It adhered uh, in a very uh, good way. Max Weber, when he visited the United States at the turn, at the end of the 19th century, had a similar sort of observation. He said that one would expect American society to be a formless heap of sand, of grains of individuals, but in fact, there was a lumpiness to it. Uh, those grains of sand adhered in, in, in a lot of different forms uh, that was really quite, uh, quite striking. And I think that most Americans understand this, I mean, when they think about it a little bit, that in fact there has been this art of association that has been uh, very important in the entire history of, of uh, the American uh, polity and, and society. On the other hand, it seems to me that there have been very large changes that have taken place in American society and culture over the last couple of generations, roughly from the 1950s to the present, really in my lifetime. And I think that in that period, the United States has gone from being a high trust society to increasingly uh, a low trust society. Uh, I don't want to go in, 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 in terribly much detail to the reasons why I think that this is true. Perhaps we can uh, talk about that a little bit more in the discussion period. But the manifestations of this, I think, are undeniable. Uh, last January, 
uh, Professor Robert Putnam of Harvard wrote uh, an article that got a lot of attention whose title was Bowling Alone. Uh, he noted that uh, bowling is more popular than ever in the United States, but that people don't bowl in bowling leagues anymore. They bowl as individuals or they bowl as families, uh, but they don't bowl as social groups. Uh, and he presented a lot of, I think, rather disturbing evidence in that article about the decline of sociability in the U.S. Uh, for example, uh, the number of members of, of certain traditional service organizations like the Red Cross or parents' teachers' organizations or uh, traditional clubs you know, like the Kiwanis or Rotarians for small businessmen have suffered uh, dramatic declines over the last 30 or 40 years. When they do value surveys of Americans over time, uh, there's one uh, that's been done for, for the last four decades in which Americans are simply asked, do you trust other Americans? And the number has gone from roughly two-thirds to one-third uh, in the past from the 1950s to the early 1990s. Uh, and in other ways, I think you know, the, the big social phenomena that everybody is aware of, like the rise of litigation uh, in the United States and the rise of violent crime, are symptoms of the, the rather dramatic uh, falling off of social trust uh, in the United States. And this has now, in recent uh, uh, years, been overlaid by, I think, increasing tensions among ethnic groups, and particularly between uh, African Americans and, uh, and other uh, racial uh, and ethnic groups. Uh, and while the American economy, uh, since the last recession, uh, looks to be in very good shape, uh, you know, has been growing uh, nicely with good productivity gains, I believe that social capital is something that can be built up only slowly and uh, is uh, spent rather quickly, and that Americans are living off of an accumulated degree of social capital, and that they need to look to its replenishment if they are to remain economically and politically healthy uh, into the next century. Now, to put all of this in a somewhat larger perspective, it, it seems to me that there are really two uh, conclusions that uh, the kinds of issues that I raise in this current book uh, leads you to. The first is that social life and civil society are critical to capitalism. That is to say, modernity, if we understand modernity as the Enlightenment's vision of a rational society in which rational individuals come together to fulfill their own individual ends, uh, if that is the model for both uh, uh, liberal democracy and for the capitalist marketplace, that it does not work by itself. It needs to be leavened by traditional moral values, by moral reciprocity, by a sense of obligation to other people, by trust, uh, if these forms are to work. Uh, and I think the most obvious way that you can see that is in the family. If you regard the family as simply a contract between the husband and wife, uh, for the satisfaction of their individual needs. They will never stay up you know, late at night changing all the diapers and making the sacrifices that real-world families actually make uh, in order to survive, despite what the economist Gary Becker has, has written about the economic uh, 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 motives underlying uh, family life. But I think the second conclusion runs in the opposite direction, that capitalism in many ways is critical to social life, that outside the family, the capitalist workplace, the market, uh, the firm that we work for, the business that we start, is the main opportunity that we have for social connectedness to other people, and that that is absolutely vital in establishing our identities and in making us you know, satisfied with our, with our own lives. Uh, the sociologist, uh, uh, the great sociologist Durkheim noted that people fell, feel what he called anomie, this sense of normlessness, when they are disconnected from people. And that, that was one of the conditions of modern society. And in many respects, the capitalist workplace is the place in which social structure is, is given to people. Uh, and in many respects, you can see the importance of this in Eastern Europe. Uh, in many parts of Eastern Europe, the legacy of totalitarianism was uh, not only to create a vast political tyranny, but to totally destroy civil society and the family. Uh, you know, the Pavel Morozov story uh, of Stalin's is not an accident. There was a deliberate attempt on the part of uh, Leninist parties to subordinate the family to the state, 
uh, to subordinate the press and uh, small businesses and uh, uh, private organizations of all sort to eliminate them and to make everything a simple emanation of the state. And unfortunately, in those communist societies where uh, Bolshevism prevailed for, for several generations, they were all too successful. And the real problem that people in that part of the world have is that now that the state, the communist state, has crumbled uh, and has vanished into nothingness, there is nothing to take its place. Uh, they don't have strong families. They don't have strong voluntary associations. Uh, and if they had a capitalist market, at least it would give them some sense of social identity and connectedness. But in the absence of that kind of market, all that they are left to fall back on are things like ethnic identity, which they, you know, which is uh, in a way faute de mieux, uh, the only way that they have of relating to other people. And as you can uh, see before you in the Balkans today, uh, that has led to a total disaster. So the marketplace is critical to, so it, it's critical to social life and in that way to the future of democracy as well. Now, to demonstrate the total consistency of everything that I've written in my life, I would like to bring uh, bring us back to Hegel. Uh, Hegel was, of course, the inventor of the phrase the end of history. He declared that history ended after the Battle of Jena in 1806. And this, in fact, was not such a ridiculous idea because what he meant was that Napoleon defeated the Prussian monarchy uh, at the Battle of Jena and brought the ideas of the French Revolution, the ideas of liberty and equality, uh, to his particular part of Germany. Uh, and that while it was not universally victorious, what it meant was that the idea, the vanguard, had uh, made its conquest and it was simply a matter of time until the provinces caught up with the metropolis. Well, I think in the last uh, couple of generations, we've seen much of the provinces catching up with the metropolis. Uh, and so in that sense, the, the state part of it, the universal and homogeneous state, uh, has largely been set. But I think that we often forget that Hegel was also the philosopher that not only uh, glorified the state, but believed that civil society and the family were absolutely critical elements of modernity. And in fact, I would say that Hegel is a philosopher that said that it was civil society more than any other characteristic that identified what modern life was all about. So that even as we have arrived at the end of history and are all capitalist democracies, we still continue to need a high degree of social trust. So thank you very much, and I look forward to uh, our further discussion. Thank you. Ladies and gentlemen. Ding, ding. This one is on. Yeah. I think they know. Yes, they, they do. Ladies and gentlemen, I'm sure that you will agree with me that we all should be duly grateful to Mr. Fukuyama for giving us his uh, well thought through expose. Uh, and in particular, I should like to thank him for drawing our attention to the fact that economists should take uh, due attention of the cultural factors involved in economic decisions. Mr. Fukuyama drew attention to the matter of chopsticks. I don't know whether that, in fact, is an economic decision that would perhaps stress the definition of what, is, uh, what the economy is, but nonetheless, he is, I think, perfectly right in saying that economists should not be blind to cultural factors and indeed that uh, they should um, uh, be aware of the cultural background to uh, e economic developments. Uh, in that respect, I think he is perfectly right. Uh, now, in the 15 minutes that have been allotted to us uh, for our discussion, <clears throat> after which I hope that the public will participate with questions, in, these, in this quarter of an hour, I should like to touch upon three points. 
Um, I shall mention them first, and then I shall develop them one by one. The first point concerns the validity of the distinction between, on the one hand, the United States, Japan, and Germany, on the other hand, France, Italy, and China, a distinction that depends upon, is based upon the various degrees to which these societies are characterized by the phenomenon of trust. The second point uh, relates to the correlation between the generalized trust that Mr. Fukuyama advocates and economic prosperity or economic growth. What exactly is that correlation? And the third matter is a point that I should like to make about the civil society, which um, uh, Mr. Fukuyama uh, spoke about, and which we in Holland would call uh, Middenveld. Now, <clears throat> uh, something about the first point. Uh, that is the distinction, as I said, between, on the one hand, the United States, Germany, and, and Japan, on the other hand, France, Italy, and China. And in particular, um, I am foxed by Mr. Fukuyama's putting uh, the United States and Japan in one basket. I'm sure it's an objection that has often been made, but I hope he'll forgive me if I, if I um, bring that up once again. Because if, we look at the, if I look at the United States, first of all, I think of the Constitution, which calls for life, liberty, and the pursuit of happiness of the individual. And therefore, I think that the whole Constitution has a bearing on this distinction between the collectivity and the individual, which to my mind, which to my mind is heavily biased, is heavily leans towards the individual. I think of the matter of slavery. I think of the matter of the civil war. And then of the raw phase of American capitalism between, say, 1870 and 1910. I think of the, uh, the, the oil barons, the, the steel barons, the railroad barons, the, the Vanderbilts, the, the Rockefellers, uh, of, the, of the Chicago meat packing factories uh, described so vividly by Upton Sinclair. Um, does that make me think of um, trust? No. No, it doesn't. It makes, me, <clears throat> it makes me think of exactly the phrase that Mr. Fukuyama mentioned. It makes me think of rugged individualism. It makes me think of the phrase that violence is as American as apple pie. Um, and uh, I myself, uh, I have had to deal in my professional background before my present one, the last one, when I sold oil. I have, I've had to deal with American businessmen, and my experience has been that until one puts down every point in the contract on paper and until it is duly signed and delivered by lawyers, it's not a deal. Is that trust? No. When I think of trust, I think of Lloyd's in London, the big insurance markets. In London, <coughs> yes, yes, indeed. In Lloyd's, in London, uh, it, London was based, based on trust. The city of London is based on trust. And in the end, of course, the, the deals are, are jotted down on paper and they're formalized, but it's based on trust and what's happened to Lloyd's. Um, so when I think of America, I do not think of, of, um, of trust. Uh, of course, uh, Mr. Fukuyama is right. There is an extensive uh, Middenveld, extensive civil society, the Elks and the Kiwanis and the Rotarians and the charitable foundations, all very important, but they are defensive mechanisms. They are defensive mechanisms against nature, against the Indians, against bandits, against uh, the fact that there is no uh, social insurance, at least there used not to be a form of social insurance, much less than now. So it's a defensive mechanism, and I, for the life of me, I cannot see how the vigor and the strength of American capitalism is based on trust. I, I can't see that. Now, on Japan, may I admit that I'm an um, adept of Mr. Karl von Wolfram, whom you know, because we spoke about him the last time. And I would say that Japanese society, following in the footsteps of, of Mr. Van Wolf, is based not so much on trust as on constraint. Constraint. I've been in that country various times, but, but I'm not a, a, nothing like an expert on, on Japan. I would say that society is based 
more on constraints than on trust. Now, may I ask you, Mr. Fukuyama, to, if you, if you wish, to, to reply to some of the elements of my first point. Well, uh, I would be the last to deny that uh, individualism is an important uh, uh, constitutive part of American civilization. Uh, there's a, individualism is built into uh, its fundamental law, the entire liberal tradition that goes from Hobbes to Locke to the American founding fathers is based on a notion of uh, civil society being based on the rights of the individual and certainly the kind of Protestantism that was practiced in, in the United States is also a highly individualist, I mean it's, it's another uh, uh, ideological source of support for, for individualism. So uh, you're quite right that that is a fundamental tendency. But on the other hand, it seems to me that in, in most of American history, that individualism has really been moderated uh, to a great extent by this proclivity for uh, civil society. Uh, and I think that, uh, you know, I may, may not have been made this sufficiently clear, but in my view, I, you know, I don't admire uh, Japan and Germany for simply being high-trust societies. I think that it is entirely possible uh, to have a society in which trust is too high because one of the paradoxical features of trust is that to the ex you know a trust is always based on the existence of a common set of moral norms shared within a community and to some extent the higher those internal bonds the weaker they are with people outside and the greater intolerance and and uh, 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 lack of fellow feeling there is for people that stand outside the uh, community and so I think in in many ways it's not an accident that uh, Germany and Japan have had uh, this aggressive history towards their neighbors be precisely because they were such high trust societies and I think one of the great virtues of America is that it always found a nice balance between that individualism that was the source of considerable innovation and entrepreneurship and the sense of community that created durable uh, uh, organizations so that you have an institution like the Mormon Church that was founded by uh, this, this very strange prophet, Joseph Smith, who is an archetypical individualist uh, whose followers set off for Utah uh, and the church was then institutionalized by an organizational genius named Brigham Young. And today, you know, the Mormon church has 8 million members and a portfolio larger than, you know, most major multinational uh, corporations. And, and, you know, there's the same story with Apple computers and any number of American uh, uh, organizations. Uh, so I think it's really uh, the combination of the two. And incidentally... You, you made me think of an important point that I neglected in my talk. Uh, you said that you thought that American civil society was uh, a bulwark against mm. the, you know, the lack of social insurance and so forth. I would put it just the opposite way, uh, that in a certain sense, uh, civil society is the natural home for many kinds of social services. Uh, you know, there are certain things that the family can do that no other institution can do. There are certain things that religious charities can, uh, there are certain welfare services that religious charities can dispense that can't be dispensed by a state organization. And I think that one of the great problems at the source of the decline of American civil society in the past couple of generations is in fact the growth of the American state that has taken over uh, a lot of these functions that really properly should have been left in the sphere of civil society uh, that thereby weakened it and in a way that's a general characteristic of all of the low trust societies that I discuss in my book that all China, France and Italy or at least southern Italy uh, all went through a prolonged period in which the state uh, uh, you had a very strong centralized bureaucratic state uh, that tried to subordinate as much of civil society to its own ends as possible and thereby weakened the ability of people to organize themselves spontaneously. Uh, and in many parts of the world now it seems to me the, the project uh, that, that is before us in a way is to uh, take the state out of the running of things that are better left you know, to civil society itself and I think uh, you know, that's very much, uh, you know, what needs to be done in, uh, uh, in the United States. I won't give you any advice here in Holland because I'm, uh, I'm not Dutch, but I think in many other parts of the world that is uh, on the agenda. Thank you very much. Uh, my second question is about the correlation between, on the one hand, uh, this generalized form of trust that Mr. Fukuyama has been speaking about tonight, and on the other hand, economic growth or prosperity, if you like. Now, he um, 
uh, again, turning to this distinction between, on the one hand, uh, Italy, France, and China, on the other hand, Japan and the United States and, and Germany, um, uh, Mr. Fukuyama says that uh, China, uh, France, and Italy are characterized less by this generalized form of trust than by what he calls familism. That is, uh, I suppose, true, uh, certainly in France and in Italy. Uh, there is um, an undeclared civil war between the citizen and the state. Uh, that's very noticeable in both countries. And therefore, the state is inclined to play a larger part in the economic life of the country than, for example, in northwestern Europe. But the economic growth is quite considerable, as Mr. Fukuyama himself pointed out. Uh, China has uh, enjoyed the fastest economic growth over the last 20 years. And since 1945, since the end of the Second World War, France and Italy were third and fifth in the league table of economic growth. So my question is, what's the point of this <laughs> distinction? Uh, indeed, when there is trust, it obviates, um, it, it um, it prevents transaction costs in society. It's simpler <clears throat> to, to deal um, when, when trust prevails than when it doesn't prevail. But what is the point of emphasizing um, this element of trust if one sees, when one sees that countries like China, France, and Italy, the ones that he mentioned, grow just as fast or perhaps faster than some other countries? I've already mentioned the <coughs> uh, uh, growth of the United States and the fact that I do not think it is based upon a generalized form of trust, but rather is based on the, um, the normal economic factors of economic growth, such as markets, competition, technology, and skills. Um, and, and, and there again, I don't see the connection. Now, lastly on this point is the match of big firms. Mr. Fukuyama has emphasized tonight and also in his book, uh, the rise of large firms. The large firms um, that obtain, that exist in Holland and in England, like Shell and Unilever and, and Philips um, and some others, are not, in my view, are not a result of any kind of trust or civil society in Holland. Shell ex came into existence and grew and was based upon the Dutch Empire. Um, it started in the, uh, in the oil fields of, of Indonesia. Uh, and then Deterding teamed up with Marcus Samuel, who, who traded within the British Empire. So I think the fact that both British and Dutch had uh, a colonial empire had much more to do with the, with the growth and the coming into being of Shell than and any kind of, of, uh, of, of, uh, of civil society in, in Holland or in England. Um, why doesn't France have big companies? I think because the French don't like to leave their country. <laughs> and it is to a certain extent, well, it's true. To a certain extent, they're quite right. I mean, it's a fantastic country that has everything to offer that one should wish for. So why should they go abroad? The French don't like to be expatriates. Uh, the British and the Dutch are, 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 um, have been expatriates for, for a long time. And that, I think, has much more to do with the existence of big firms, which, after all, uh, uh, have a, a global reach and work on the global markets than any kind of, of uh, societal development. Now, what would you like to say to that? <laughs> <laughs> well, of course, the, uh, <coughs> the French had their empire, too. But they didn't... Uh, they didn't have their equivalent of, uh, of uh, Shell. Well, first, on the first question of what difference this makes, uh, I have a couple of different answers. First of all, the, the, the cases that I picked in my book are all successful countries, economically successful countries. And you're quite right that in terms of uh, uh, aggregate uh, uh, economic growth, uh, there's not uh, uh, you know, a big difference between China and Japan or Italy and Germany. Uh, but as I said, it does make a big difference in terms of the global division of labor that certain, you know, it, the distribution, just like the distribution of, of capital and labor determines uh, comparative advantage in classical uh, 
uh, Ricardian economics, it seems to me that the distribution of social capital determines uh, other sorts of comparative advantage, particularly in the business of who is able to produce large-scale organizations and who is better at producing smaller ones, so that uh, you know, Italy will remain locked in the sectors it's locked in and not simply as a result of its level of development. I would think you would expect them to stay there for a good long time. And similarly, China is not going to duplicate uh, Japan's development path. But I would point out that there is really a, a vast tier of countries that fall below uh, what I labeled as the low trust countries. Uh, one example of that, you know, is, is Russia. Uh, China, you know, has actually a great deal of social capital. Uh, it just happens that it's all concentrated in kinship groups. Uh, and one of the great problems in Russia right now is that uh, they don't have strong families, uh, so that the Chinese were able to decollectivize agriculture and disband all the communes in 1978, and the Chinese peasant family was largely intact, and it became the dominant producer uh, when given the opportunity. They doubled Chinese agricultural output in the space of about five years in the early 80s. Uh, the Russians have not been able to do that because they you know, lack even the social capital that's contained in families. And so uh, it seems to me, and that's a, you know, a similar kind of problem that's faced by you know, quite a number of other uh, less developed countries, and I think there, the impact on, on aggregate growth will, uh, will show up. Uh, as to the question of what produces large co companies, I think that, you know, I'm not uh, trying to produce a monocausal explanation for, uh, you know, for all economic phenomenon. And obviously, there are many reasons why large companies proliferate. You can change tax laws and antitrust laws in a way that encourage small versus large. And uh, there are all sorts of other manipulations. And if you have an empire, I'm sure it, it, uh, uh, it doesn't hurt. But there is something about familistic societies that prevents them from creating large institutions, even when they desperately want them. Uh, for instance, I mean, in driving by the West India House, I, I was struck, uh, uh, you know, there was a remark of Colbert's that I, I uh, you know, the great um, French finance minister that uh, I quote in my book that he, you know, he said that, you know, the problem with the, the French private businessmen is that they have not been able to create the equivalent of either the British or the Dutch East India companies, and therefore the French state was going to have to step in and do that. Uh, and I think that that's a persistent you know, pattern in French economic history, that it's not simply that they didn't have an empire, because they, they in fact did have one. Uh, they do actually like to go abroad. I've met a number of them in foreign countries. Um, <laughs> But uh, there's something about the familistic nature of French business that is, you know, quite pronounced and really never existed here in Holland or in Germany. Thank you. Now, um, <laughs> well, I mean, I only have 15 minutes. Uh, the, the public also wants to, um, I assume, wants to put some questions. Uh, I shall uh, complete this discussion round with a few remarks on, 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 this, on this civil society, on, on Middenfeld, as we call it in Holland. Um, I should like to um, draw the attention of Mr. Fukuyama to the fact that civil society has two faces. One face is the defense of the individual against the state. Because all these intermediate bodies, organizations, protect the individual. It's an integrating, it's a defensive mechanism. But it also has a repressing face, that's its other face. Because the individual may be caught in the meshes of an organization which he cannot escape. And it may repress him. Uh, the most famous example, I suppose, is the feat of uh, upper-class Chinese women before 1911, because they were broken. Um, the family is one of the intermediate uh, structures, and it was extremely, and still is, extremely strong in China, as you have pointed out many times. And it had, at least before 1911, and I have the feeling that similar sort of phenomena still exist, um, a, a terrible effect on, on women of upper class family and, uh, families. Unfortunately, that was abolished in 1911 by the Chinese Revolution. So I want to point uh, I want to draw your attention to this, the, the, these two faces of intermediate structures. That's, that's my first point. And my second point relates to this country. We in Holland have, uh, as I think we all uh, would agree, a consensual society. 
We have a consensual society, which explains, for example, that debate in this country is not an often seen thing, because it confronts people, and in a consensual society there is no premium on confrontations. They are, we live among countries like, like France and England, which are confrontational societies. Now, because of that um, fact and aspect of our, of our, of our society, um, and because of the enormously developed um, um, middenveld, civil society in Holland, we have, led, we have, been, um, we have been brought to, uh, the, the, the government has been brought to decentralize the execution of important laws in the field of social security to what we call the social partners, in other words, to, to, um, to employers and to, to employees, or rather to employer federations and an employee federation, which is something, something different. And the result is that, this is my reading of the situation, the result is that we have had less economic growth than otherwise we would have had. Because if you look at the, the, the ranking of Holland in the growth in the, I should say it that way, the growth uh, table uh, of, of European countries, we have slipped since 1970. We have slipped since 1970. We used to be the, 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 the wealthiest nation uh, among the original founder nations of the, uh, of the common market, as it was then called. Uh, and now we are in the larger economic, uh, uh, in the larger European Union, we have a middle ranking position. And I think that is because the execution of these uh, social security laws was, was, was uh, decentralized uh, and, and they were executed by social partners who had, of course, their own uh, fish to fry. So that is a drawback of this trust that you so advocate. Well, I, uh, first of all, would be the last to say that associations uh, are simply a good thing. I mean, after all, the mafia is, a, is an association. <laughs> I hadn't thought of that in yeah, this respect. Right. Uh, you know, the mafia is an intermediate group between the family and, and the state, uh, but it has rather sinister purposes. And I think that there are a lot of, uh, uh, in fact, you know, one of the big uh, uh, complaints about American politics today, and I think probably the politics of other countries, is that, in fact, in a way, there are too many associations. They're not moral communities. They are interest groups. Uh, that are very effective in lobbying for their narrow point of view and that make uh, you know, the smooth functioning of, of deliberation in Congress uh, subject to you know, special interest money and, and, and so forth. And uh, I don't deny that that, uh, 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 that, that is a problem. Uh, on the other hand, it seems to me that what you've got to do is you know, calculate in a way the net value of civil society by you know, uh, calculating its positive value and somehow deducting, you know, the, 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 the negative parts of it. And on the whole, I would think that Holland has actually been quite blessed by the fact that it has uh, such a dense network of, of civil associations and, in fact, is a consensual uh, country. I don't have anything to say about the particular, you know, social security arrangement because I'm not familiar with it. And, again, I'm very loath to give advice to uh, people when I'm a guest in their country about how they should organize their uh, their own politics and society. But in general, it seems to me that, you know, uh, Dutch people should not underestimate, uh, you know, the, the high degree of, of social consensus that exists. I mean, believe me, you know, having lived for many years in Los Angeles, I can tell you what it's like to live in a country that's, uh, or in a, in a city that's riven by, you know, by very uh, great, uh, you know, chasms, uh, you know, in political views, in, in, in ethnic outlook, in, in uh, you know, in just the general approach to life, and, uh, you know, in which that sense of rootedness and community is, is very much uh, frayed. Uh, and I think that, uh, uh, you know, there, there is probably a general, you know, issue that all of us need to look at, which is, you know, exactly where to draw the boundary between the state and civil society. Uh, and in fact, I would think that that's the largest issue, you know, that confronts most uh, uh, advanced democracies today. Uh, and whether you've done that properly in, in Holland, I think, is, you know, is up for you to d decide. But I, I, at least you have a strong civil society that you can, that you can draw on uh, in the first place. Well, thank you very much, uh, Mr. Fukuyama, for being so patient as to answer these questions. Uh, we have now... Um, uh, we have now come to uh, questions from, from the audience, from the public. May I call for questions from 
from you all. Um, may I ask you to come forward? There's a microphone here. I don't know whether there's one in the back, but there's at least I one here. To, I happen to be very close to a mic, so I thought, why should I not be the first? I may I ask uh, you to, to mention your name? Please. Oh, yes. My name is Arne Stam. Yes. Yes. <laughs> uh, that explains everything. Uh, <laughs> um, I have a question on these low and high trust countries, and uh, you mentioned then Japan and China. I was personally interested in how you would rate Korea, because after all, they do have a quite a sizable automobile industry. Secondly, with regard to Japan, I thought that the organization of a, um, of a firm seems to be structured somewhat like a family, in that you have a a great amount of adherence to the, to the firm. Uh, you don't change jobs, I thought, as much as, as, as we do in some other places. And I would like also if, if you could ex say something about this uh, more kind of family type structure of the Japanese firm. Thank you. Thank you very much. Because time is limited, I shall ask the two gentlemen behind the, the gentleman who put the question just now to put their questions and then Mr. Fukuyama will answer three questions at the same time. <laughs> oh, great. Thank you for your multiplexing, Ben. Well, uh, on the chair and in your book, you, you uh, advise the replenishing of trust when it's declining. And neither in the book nor in your speech have I heard anything really contributing to that. What is needed to replenish trust? Is that another revolution or just something like the Puritans that you mentioned somewhere? Thank you. And maybe we have now the third question, please. Uh, thank you. I had a more practical question. Uh, you also talk about the uh, European Union. Um, and my interest is more specificate in the uh, financial uh, part. Concrete, my question is, do you trust in the European Union? <laughs> <laughs> All right. <coughs> Three questions. The first one on some aspects of Korea and Japan. The second one on how does one replenish trust if it um, becomes deficient? And the third question, a very short and apt one, do you trust the European Union? <laughs> Mr. Fukuyama. All right, well, on the question of Korea, uh, Korea is another uh, somewhat anomalous uh, uh, society. I have a chapter of it in my book. Uh, it, in, in terms of its social structure, it is much closer to China than it is to Japan. Uh, that is to say, kinship is important in, in uh, it's a very Confucian society in which kinship is quite in, uh, uh, an important uh, uh, social bond. Uh, and in many ways, it ought to have a similar uh, structure of industry uh, to Taiwan and, and, and Hong Kong. And yet, uh, Korean industry is highly concentrated. In fact, it's more concentrated uh, than that of Japan, as you say, it, it has a you know large car industry and make it, they make, build semiconductors and so forth. Uh, and in that case, I think that uh, you know this is simply a case of the victory of of really social engineering over culture. Uh, that uh, you know Korean society was never allowed to develop along what would have been culturally more comfortable lines, because uh, the Korean state after 1961 began shoveling money at certain preferred large, uh, what they call chai bowl, uh, these very large conglomerates, uh, and it started them off this very rapid growth path. I mean, you, I mean, virtually anybody could grow fast if you got money at negative interest rates. Um, and, and therefore, you have uh, these industrial giants today. But what's interesting about these Korean chai bowl is that, in a way, there's a Chinese company just underneath the surface, uh, that succession is a very difficult problem uh, in uh, Chinese, uh, in, in, in Korean companies, because there's always a very strong cultural preference to give it to the eldest son, and if the eldest son is incompetent, uh, these companies have to go through enormous uh, uh, manipulations to try to pass it on to somebody else. In Japan, it's much easier because, first of all, there's no familistic succession. It simply passes on to, you know, the, the, the next professional manager that the board of directors uh, uh, selects. Uh, as to the Japanese, um, you know, whether they're family companies, I think they metaphorically are like families, but it's important that they're not literal families, whereas in China they are literally families. Uh, the question about the replenishing of trust is a very uh, good one. Uh, 
if you truly believe that trust is a is a cultural product, then I think that it is very difficult to come up with a, you know, a ten point program for the next government uh, to uh, replenish trust because, in a sense, it 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 comes from the sorts of social relations that individuals have uh, with one another and. You know, governments are able, in a way, they, they can turn a ratchet in one direction, but they can't turn it back the other way. That is to say, they can do a lot to undermine trust, uh, just as they can, you know, undertake certain policies that undermine families. But it is very difficult to see how they turn it backwards in ways that, that, uh, 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 that build trust back up again. And I think if I look at, you know, the situation in the United States and ask the question, well, how do you restore uh, that social fabric and, and rebuild trust, uh, it's not clear to me that there's an obvious, you know, program, a government program. I think what our problem is, is, is a culture of excessive individualism and, and, you know, the culture of rights that has grown up in the last couple of generations. And that unless there's a change in the way that people generally think about the relationship between the individual and all of the other uh, groups to which he, uh, she or he is, is a member, then you won't have a solution. Uh, to the problem. On the question of the European Union, <laughs> do I trust it? Well, uh, fortunately, I don't have to answer that question since I don't live here. I would say it is, it, it does strike me as, as a little bit odd uh, in a way, this desire to homogenize a large, you know, uh, economic region. There are obviously economic, uh, you know, benefits from that, but in a certain sense, it seems to me that you know, what's going on in the world now is that people are really desperate to hold on to, uh, you know, the, a certain degree of cultural distinctiveness. And in a way, that's a natural outgrowth from the homogenization that, that occurs in the global marketplace and the similarity of consumer goods and, and you know, mass communications that, that you know, brings uh, everybody together. Uh, and, um, you know, I can see that, you know, why as a European one might not you know, want simply everything, you know, about one's economic life dictated from, uh, uh, from Brussels. So I do think that there's a certain, you know, legitimate uh, reason for, you know, questioning certain aspects of, of that project, but uh, maybe I should <laughs> just leave it at that. Well, certainly the, um, the, the matter of national identity in the European Union is a matter full of, um, uh, of uh, pitfalls. Uh, it's a very complicated debate, and, and um, we don't have the time to pursue the subject, but that certainly is of the, of the greatest importance. There was somebody in the back, somebody in the back who wanted to put a question. May I ask the person involved whether he still has that question or whether it has already been answered? Well, I see nobody. Perhaps um, I, I may ask you to put the first of the next three questions. <laughs> Hope you yes, sir, go ahead. Could some... you give your name, please? Yeah, Bushma. I uh, want to put one question to Mr. Fukuyama and when I may also to Mr. Bolkestein. The first one is the uh, difference between France, Germany, Italy, United States. Can that not best be explained by history? And I mean the, the uh, religious history. I mean to the fact... Did you Cal say the religious history? Re religious history, yes. This Calvinism, which is connected with individual capitalism, I mean that Max Weber already pointed to that. On the other hand, the Roman Catholic tradition, which is much more connected with state capitalism. And will that also not mm -hmm. mean that mm -hmm. its differences will vanish yes. in the future? And the question to Mr. Bolkestein is about the relative backwardness of the growth in our country. Has that not much more to do with our national gas, which make <laughs> which made it far too easy this last 25 years to maintain our welfare state without really to have working for it. Uh, thank you very much. Yes, sir. Okay. My name is Kronenberg. Yes, sir. Okay. Um, first, I want to add some, uh, something about growth. Uh, uh, it is so growth means nothing when you come from nothing. I mean, uh, then you can make high marks when your industry is low and this a very necessary detail in statistics. Because when you are already high, it's high to achieve more. And then uh, about French, 
Uh, yes. This, this is the multiplication you can easily get in wrong wisdom in books. Uh, about French, uh, why uh, we put up France as not so successful in the past in the world, probably only with Napoleon. But I think, philosophically uh, spoken, uh, I think it all depends uh, what your uh, uh, people, land, country, uh, mentality is and attitude to your own people and the self-critic and the critic you have in your democracy to uh, get on a higher level uh, that you can give some more to other people in the world you work together and then they will do to work you to, together with you I mean then you achieve success and when you are not of this kind of stuff in your country and your um, wisdom to in trade and work together, you achieve less. That's it. I, I'm, I'm not sure whether the question is clear. <laughs> <laughs> it was. It was no question. At least but was, last was, Friday, right, last Friday, uh, I spoke in Groningen already with Mr. 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 Fukuyama, Fukuyama, and I told him on the end also something. He re will remind Mr. me. Mr. Thank you very much, <laughs> Mr. Fukuyama. To Mr. Fukuyama, the question is clear, and he will okay. answer it. Okay. Now, the, the the last person, and we have the three questions together. Uh, my name is Ron Miltenberg. Uh, I would like to have some clarification on the uh, philosophical justification of your uh, central thesis, just for my uh, sake, and also since I'm concerned by the uh, possible political uh, implications, especially where uh, Mr. Bolkestein and uh, Mr. Fukuyama seem to contradict one another, yet seem to support, at least I understood that even on the points where Mr. Uh, Bolkestein contradicts you, he also uh, seems to support you where, as far as the political uh, implications are concerned, Therefore, it dawned to me when you were talking about it that actually uh, the central thesis of your uh, of this uh, this book seems to be the very same thesis of your last book, only in reverse, because uh, like you uh, explained uh, several times, it's of course based on only say five pages in the Phenomenology <laughs> Disguises, in which the master has this anerkennung, this recognition of the knecht. Now, this seems to be in this book. This seems to be the other way around or at the same argument in reverse, like Mr. Bolkenstein already said, it's not that people in America trust one another, it seems to be like Mr. Uh, uh, oh boy, am I nervous. Fukuyama. <laughs> 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 Mr. <laughs> Mr. Fukuyama uh, stated. <laughs> <laughs> well, you met a guy before, but it's my first <laughs> time. <laughs> Will you please complete your question? Yes. Uh, this doesn't seem to be that people in America have a high trust towards one another or amongst one another, but they put their trust in a higher kind of institution, so they put their trust in their life in a higher... It's also a kind of anerkennung of the knecht, the knecht anerkennung, the meister. So in this book and in the other book, there seems to be that uh, the, the same argument or the same thesis, these five little pages from these 600 pages in this big, big book, seems to be the central point. And I'm especially concerned for the political implications, uh, since you have been talking for like 45 minutes, always saying liberal democracy. And in the very last sen sentence you said, capitalist democracy. So I, I, my question would be, do I see this philosophical justification in his right perspective? And also, in both cases, if, if, this, if it is on a canon, then in both counts it will lead to a class society. And the class society, however, has been called as well liberal as well ca uh, capitalist. So I hope this question is clear. <laughs> Thank you very much. Mr. Fukuyama, the best of luck. <laughs> well, I'll, uh, <clears throat> I'll do my best to answer those questions. If I don't answer the actual questions that were asked, I'll answer another question <laughs> and we'll still have a discussion. <laughs> um, the, the first question on the uh, importance of religion. Uh, I think uh, religion actually is important to this story in quite a number of ways. For example, and, and, and here in a certain way I think that uh, the important distinction is less between Protestant and Catholic than between uh, 
a kind of centralized state church and a, a decentralized church. For example, in my account of why the art of association is as strong as it is in the United States, uh, the one factor I point to as being critical to this is the fact that the form of Protestantism in the United States was always sectarian Protestantism, that the original Congregational and Presbyterian uh, churches that uh, began in the United States uh, were de the dissenting churches of Europe. And religious life in the United States, it's been described in a way as a free market of religions. Uh, and I think that you know, that was absolutely critical because in a certain sense one would think that a national church would enhance the sense of national community because it would unite uh, politics and culture uh, in, in some way. But in fact, in real life it has actually the opposite effect uh, that generally people don't like to be forced into a particular uh, mode of religious belief and uh, they tend to resist that, whereas you have a more genuine uh, degree of religiosity when uh, religion is voluntary. And I think that the voluntary character of religion uh, is one of the explanations why uh, the American people to this day uh, remain uh, uh, believers to a far greater extent than, than uh, many European societies that did have centralized churches in which uh, secularization has gone uh, very far. And I think that that form of Protestantism was extremely important in the American art of association because uh, religious sects were constantly splitting off from one another, which was an act of individualism, but they were then, uh, you know, they would create a new kind of community with even stronger internal moral bonds than the, uh, than the larger established church uh, that they left. And this habit of, you know, creating new religious communities, I think then be took on a secularized form and, and became a, a generalized uh, kind of art of association. Uh, in many Catholic countries, uh, you know, I think you have this opposite uh, uh, tendency where a centralized church becomes simply an ally of a centralized state. Uh, and it begets, you know, anti-clericalism and uh, a kind of polarized politics. And so that if you look at Italy, there's actually a, an inverse proportion to the strength of, uh, you know, uh, church attendance and, and, and Catholic feeling. Uh, and uh, a civic, you know, civil society, so that the church is the weakest in the north, uh, but civil society is the strongest, and conversely, it's it's the strongest in the south, and and civil society is 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 the weakest. So, but I think the issue, and, and these days, particularly when Catholic doctrine has changed uh, so much over the last couple of generations, I think the doctrinal differences between Protestant and Catholic matter. Uh, less, uh, but the, you know, the question of centralized versus decentralized, I think, is more important. Do you want to answer the... Yes, um, yes, I, indeed. Um, uh, the, question, uh, the question was uh, whether I was of the opinion that the existence of natural gas in this country slowed our economic growth. Now, I suppose a case can be made for our natural gas to be likened to heroin because it enabled us to have uh, some very expensive habits. And once uh, natural gas uh, finishes, we shall have to kick the habits. In fact, we are now trying in a very painful way to kick those habits. So I suppose that comparison can be made. Uh, and I also feel that we could have used that money, uh, the money represented by that gas, in a, in a better way. For example, by endowing our old age pension system, AOV, with a capital base. And the AOV, the old age pensions, were started in, I think, 1957. And um, they were not, uh, it was not endowed with a capital base because there was no money. So uh, the, the incomings and outgoings were, were, um, uh, were the, the, the outgoings were, were um, defrayed by the incomings of any particular year. Now, had we been had the governments of the day been uh, more sensible uh, and more, um, more courageous, uh, they would have used the income from natural gas to provide the AOV with, uh, with a capital base, but unfortunately that was not the case. Now, I think there is time for one more question. Well, Who, actually, oh, I'm, I'm sorry, question. I'm sorry. Mr. Fukuyama has had time to think more about the other questions, and he now wants... Well, it, it, go ahead, go ahead. I think we ought... Yeah. Go ahead. L let me just... Um, if I understood the, the second question properly, uh, th there is a significant point that th the speed at which a country grows is partly related to its level of development. 
so that in a certain sense, it's not surprising that China is growing much faster than Japan today because Japan is a far more developed society and everybody slows down to a long-term growth rate of about two or three percent in real terms uh, you know, once you hit that level. And I think that that's absolutely true. And I think that, you know, I would predict that, you know, if uh, China makes it to Japan's level of, of per capita, uh, you know, uh, GNP, that uh, it's going to have, you know, greater difficulties in a way adjusting to that situation than, than the Japanese will. I do want to say something about France because it was, I'm not quite sure I understood the, the, the connection, but, you know, I think it's a, a beautiful illustration of, you know, the dangers of a state or the relationship between a state and a civil society. I love France. I, uh, whether they travel or not, you know, I've, I've lived there and, you know, I find that in many ways, you know, its culture is, you know, suits me very well. But in many ways, their, you know, their political and economic life has been highly defective for a period of four or five hundred years. And the reason for that was simply that at a certain point, you know, the French monarchy beat the French aristocracy. It happened the other way around in England and led to a completely different outcome. Uh, and the result of that has been that, you know, you had an ambitious monarchy that created a centralized nation state, subordinated all of the functions that, that had been played by what was once a very dense uh, civil society at the end of the Middle Ages, and left people with a social habit of state, of dependence on the state, uh, such that, you know, it's still impossible to build a little school or bridge, you know, anywhere in rural France without referring it to uh, a, a ministry in Paris. And I think that, you know, it, it, it's problematic, you know, from the standpoint of French democracy, which had a much harder time establishing itself than, uh, than in uh, uh, other countries, and also from the standpoint of the French uh, uh, economy, which has had, you know, these consistent weaknesses in, in, in entrepreneurship and in creating uh, suitable organizations. Thank you. I'm afraid there is time for only one more question. Um, is there any is there any lady in the audience who would like to ask a question? Well, there is there is a young lady. I see two ladies. One one up there. If you if you if you um, raise your voice, I'm sure we can hear it. Hello. Um, I have one question. Uh, what is the role of the state? Uh, does it really have to be a centralized nation state for trust to be really developed in the way you describe it in your book? Or is trust something that has been developed historically throughout the, the years? And is it also something that has been ma maintained, for example, in a uh, slave? master relationship, one way or another you could say in a feudalized society there was also a kind of trust because people knew what they were used to and what, what they could rely on. And so I'm wondering now how you see that trust is really institutionalized, on what level I still cannot really understand what you mean with the notion of trust. Okay, thank you very much. The question is clear. Um, <clears throat> now, uh, I, I said only one question, but I see that another lady... And there is another one too, so well, now we have three, three women questions after the three or nine gentlemen questions. Well, then they will have to be very brief. <laughs> <laughs> they, the, the questions will have to be very brief. Okay, I'll try. Um, I think, uh, I, I think you're right by saying that culture makes a lot of difference, how you organize e economy or families or anything what happens in society. Now my question to you is, when the whole world now is one culture with a McDonald's around every corner or uh, in every kilometer of the desert, how can this culture thing will continue? I'm not a fatalist, I don't think history ends like you say, I think it's starting now, but I, I have this question about this one sausage culture we are facing now with modern communication. Thank right. you Thank very you. much. And then now the, the last lady, the ladies always have the last word, <laughs> last lady, please. Thank you. My name is Dominique Spekmerink. I had a question on the future of your thesis. Namely, if I understood correctly, you said that the competition would be on the level of trust. Basically, that would end in 
um, countries with a high trust working on production lines which require a great deal of organization. Now, that would mean, if I understand correctly, that certain nations then therefore would not, no longer compete with these high trust nations, namely the low trust nations. Um, if one would lead that thought further, that would mean that you'd get two streams of competing nations, namely the high trust ones and the low trust ones. Is that correct? Well, thank you very much. Then uh, we have three questions. One on um, on the nature of trust and how it is to be institutionalized. Uh, the second question is on the homogenization of world culture and the third one on competition on the basis of trust between low trust and high trust nations. Mr. Fukuyama. Okay. Well, uh, as far as the, <clears throat> the, quest the first question on uh, what do I mean by trust, um, you know, there, there are obviously many uh, social groups uh, in which trust uh, can prevail. So you have trust within a family, uh, you can have trust within a larger kinship group like a clan, and then you can have uh, what I regard as the most important, which is a generalized social trust. And I think that what that requires is an absence of, you know, large social stratification so that, you know, one of the big problems in uh, uh, England today is, you know, the continuing, you know, presence of, of a high degree of, of class stratification that makes it impossible, for example, for English workers and managers to really uh, conceive of themselves in working in a single, you know, a company that they could re regard as a family without, you know, laughing or <laughs> falling out of their seats in, in, in ridicule. Uh, and so I think that, you know, therefore, uh, a master-slave society, uh, you know, cannot be uh, a high-trust society in the sense that I uh, mean it. I think that there are a number of ways of institutionalizing trust on a small scale that have to do with, uh, you know, corporate organizations, so that, for example, teams and lean manufacturing and many innovations of the last few years actually are an implementation of a high-trust workplace uh, that is very successful that I talk about at, at some length in my book, uh, but unfortunately don't have time to uh, uh, discuss here. Uh, on the question of homogenization, uh, you know, I think that the fact that there are television programs and McDonald's that are the same no matter where you go is actually a fairly superficial a level of uh, cultural homogenization. Uh, and I really do think that, you know, the more important aspects of culture are things related to values and, and particularly the kinds of, you know, social relationships that are the, the most important, how we get along with different people, the degree of reciprocity. Uh, and I believe that that is not going to be homogenized. And it's certainly not going to be homogenized simply by the fact that we all drink Coca-Cola. And in fact, it's quite interesting if you look at North America and Asia, uh, I would say that the greater uh, awareness that those two regions have for each other has actually led to a greater <laughs> sense of dislike of one another. And certainly, you know, many Asians seeing American society have decided that they don't want to participate in all those pathologies and, and, and uh, you know, that they would actually prefer that they not modernize if modernization means, uh, you know, converging with, with American society. So uh, I'm not convinced that, that uh, you know, that the true homogenization of, of cultures is, is around the corner. Uh, finally, on the question of high trust and low trust, first of all, I think that trust is one of several factors that uh, govern the global economy. And as I said, uh, you know, I'm willing to concede to modern economics that it has uncovered a number of important uh, truths about modern economics, which are all very important, which will all com uh, contribute to the competitiveness of different nations. And trust is one of only, you know, a number of factors. I just think it is important because it is relatively uh, neglected. And so therefore, I don't expect to see, uh, you know, a permanent, you know, locking into position of countries on the basis of high trust and low trust. I, as I said, I do think that there will be something of a uh, global division of labor based on the distribution of social capital. But, you know, culture can change over time. Uh, and, uh, you know, other factors can change over time so that uh, we're not, uh, in a sense, you know, doomed by the uh, degree of trust that exists in our societies, uh, you know, as to whether we will have a, uh, a good future or not. Well, thank you very much, uh, uh, Mr. Fukuyama. Uh, ladies and gentlemen, we have now reached the end of this evening. I'm sure I speak on behalf of the whole audience when I say that we have all been riveted 
by your talk and your, the answers you have given to the questions, and we are duly grateful to you for having come to Amsterdam and um, to talk to us. Uh, and I believe that Mrs. Wertheim will now want to say something, so we eclipse. Bit. Thank you very much, uh, Mr. Fukuyama, Mr. Bolkestein, for sharing your thoughts with us and for handling the discussion in such a skillful way. way. Ladies and gentlemen, our next uh, lecture will be in the lecture series American Literature today on 11 November with T.C. Boyle. Uh, Mr. Fukuyama will now uh, sign books uh, seated here at the podium. Thank you for coming. And uh, if you want another drink, you can, but don't forget the consumptiebonne first here. Thank you very much. Yeah.